Sengi Hu, everyone. Uh, good evening and welcome to our special event this evening, Indigenous Antipodes, Indigenous Women's Rights, Environmental Activism, or, and race, or Environmental Racism, Peacemaking, and Sovereignty. Uh, this conversation is hosted by the Native American and Indigenous Studies Working Group uh, and the Harvard University Native American Program, also called HUNEP. I am Anthony Trujillo, the coordinator of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Working Group. I'm a graduate student in American Studies uh, from Oque Winga Pueblo in the upper Rio Grande Valley, current day New Mexico. On behalf of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Working Group and HUNAP, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to join us for this special conversation uh, this evening with inspiring Indigenous women activists and thinkers, Bina Lakshmi Nefram and June L. Lorenzo. As a way of orienting to ourselves to the conversation, <clears throat> I'll begin by offering the Hunap land acknowledgement to which I've added my own addendum. Harvard University is situated on the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Massachusetts people. Our university honors the historic Harvard Charter of 1650, which committed our institution to quote, the education of English and Indian youth of this country. As a chartered creation of the Massachusetts colonies and Commonwealth, Harvard evolved alongside the persistence of the Massachusetts, Nipmuc, and Wampanoag nations. Located near the Charles River, this place has long served as a site of meeting, exchange, and diplomacy among nations. This evening, as we convene in this digital space from geographic, geographically disparate places, we also recognize that wherever we might be tuning in from, we are in and on within indigenous homelands, places with indigenous names that signify deep and enduring intimacies that colonial and settler colonial nation states have not erased. I'll begin by offering a brief framing comment on the title and the structure of our conversation this evening, and then we'll dive into a dialogue, uh, this e which we're all here for. Tonight's conversation, Indigenous Antipodes, brings together two Indigenous women deeply rooted in, in their own communities in two hemispheres, Bina Lakshmi Nepram, also uh, whom we, uh, has, she's invited us to call her Bina, from the Man Manipur region, along what is net currently the India-Burmese border, and June L. Lorenzo, who is the Ne and Laguna Pueblo uh, in, in current day New Mexico and Arizona. Though they may be from different parts of their world, their work is hardly oppositional. Their activism overlaps in significant ways. Both Bina and June are powerful advocates for indigenous women's rights. In their spheres, they resist environmental racism. They work to build alliances in order to promote indigenous forms of peacemaking and sovereignty for their own communities and for the many people who their work, whom their work impacts. At the same time, coming from very different geographies and wrestling with unique histories and contemporary re realities of living within colonial and settler colonial nation states, we enter into this conversation also aware that there are important distinctions between these regions and consequently in how their work plays out. Our conversation this evening seeks to uh, identify areas of overlap and also distinction in their work. So just a note about the structure of this conversation. In just a moment, we'll begin by having both Bina and June offer orientations to their own homelands and their work, uh, the critical issues facing indigenous communities and particularly the issues facing women in their respect, uh, respective regions um, in, under the nation states of India and the United States respectively. From there, we'll move into a conversation between Bina and June, guided by questions formulated by the Native American and Indigenous Studies Working Group. And then a little bit later, uh, around 7.40, 7.45, we'll transition into a time of question and answer between our panelists and all of you who are joining with us uh, this evening. Uh, as attendees, you're invited to submit written questions into the Zoom Q&A box uh, at any time during the conversation. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat or the, the Q&A box throughout the conversa conversation and we'll uh, get, as, get to as many questions as we can and we may draw some questions in earlier as well. Uh, so with that, uh, we will go ahead and get started. Um, I will first begin by introducing 
uh, Bina Lakshmi Nepram. And Bina, you can go ahead and turn on. There we go. Thank you so much. Uh, let me uh, offer your uh, the formal introduction. So Bina Lakshmi Bina Nepram is an indigenous scholar and human rights defender whose work focuses on deepening democracy and champion championing women-led peace, security, and disarmament in Manipur, Northeast India, and South Asia. She is the founder of three organizations, the Manipur Women Gun Survivors Network, the C Control Arms Foundation of India, and the Global Alliance of Indigenous Peoples, Gender Justice and Peace. In 2010, Bina also initiated the Northeast India Women Peace Initiative, or Initiative for Peace to ensure that indigenous women in Northeast India are included in peace talks and peace processes. Bina has authored and edited five books, including, including Deepening Democracy, Diversity, and Women's Rights in India, 2019, Where Are Our Women in Decision-Making, 2016, and, <clears throat> and Mekli, A Historical Fiction on Manipur, in 2004. This year, Bina is a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. Bina, we are so thankful to have you with us this evening. And I invite you to share a, a few words about where you're from and some of your work. Um, first of all, I would like uh, to pay my obeisance to uh, Hunab um, and all of you who are tuning in today in my indigenous Manipuri language. Mayambu Taramna Okturi. I pay my obeisance to each one of you and thank you for tuning in, not just uh, from around the world. I know there are friends who are watching this program today. I'm really grateful to be here and to be acquainted with both Cheryl and yourself, Anthony, and to be a part of this initiative. Um, I will just um, uh, sort of bring you the story of a part of the world um, where indigenous people live, where it's hardly known because the part of uh, the India, which is at the border with Burma that I come from, has been under a martial law since 1958 and our people have not been able to come out. So for some of the first time uh, people who are listening in today, uh, this will really upset the, the idea of India that you know, because we are at the border of India and Burma and then what is happening there? And uh, yes, it's evening, uh, afternoon for some of you, morning. Um, but we are going to bring some images for you to get an idea of what this region is about. So allow me to, uh, with your permission, to do this uh, screen. So um, I've titled it as Indigenous People, the Untold Story of Manipur and Northeast India in the Indo-Burma border. This is an image from an indig Indigenous women's market. We have a women's market. Uh, which is more than uh, more than 500, 600 years old in my part of the world. As we know, there are 476 million people, indigenous people worldwide, and two thirds of them are in Asia, where I come from. This is an image again from my home state, Manipur. Um, the other thing that I would like to just situate is that uh, Though the world knows about conflict in Syria, what happened in B Burma, what's happening in, in, in Afghanistan and other parts, there are 378 forgotten conflicts in the world. And many of them, 80% of this are in indigenous territories. I repeat, 80% of these militarized conflicts are in indigenous territories. And that's where my story will come, 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 come from. Um, the area that I come from is Manipur and the northeast of India, situated at the border with Burma. So it is our region, it's known as the Indo Burma border. This is the area shaded in red, home to 45 million indigenous groups. And, and this is where independent Asiatic nation states, and then this is the political conflict which happened. And then India sort of uh, uh, colonized us in the year 1949. And then since then we are uh, under the Indian occupation. Um, so we carry Indian passports, uh, but then um, when we go to uh, India's capital, we are always asked which country are we from because we are racially uh, and culturally distinct from the rest of India. What is interesting about this region is this area that I come from is bordering five nations. We have China, Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. 
this is the part of the region that I'm going to talk about, just bringing its story. The other thing that I wanted to bring is how, although you may have heard about conflicts of, as I mentioned, in South Asia, in Afghanistan, Kashmir, uh, this part of the conflict in this part of Northeast of India uh, is not known to the world, yet it is more than 300,000 troops of the Indian Armed Forces have occupied our territories. And if you think India is the world's largest democracy, you'll be mistaken if you hear that there is a martial law imposed on indigenous areas of the Northeast of region bordering Burma since the year 1958. I repeat, since 1958, India has imposed a martial law on indigenous territories. Under this act, any, anybody could be arrested, tortured, raped, killed on mere charges of suspicion. This is the seriousness of the situation that we live in in this part of the world. Just to make things a little peaceful, you know, some of the most places of the world where indigenous people live, they are at the borders of nation states because we, our territories were carved out. So this is this part is from my region again, which borders Myanmar and Bangladesh both. This is Sikkim, again, in our region, which borders Tibet and China, just to tell us how complex and geopolitical uh, uh, you know, importance of this area. This is Manipur, where I was born, a place which is surrounded by nine hills, mountain ranges, and a valley. And just to give a little context about this 45 million people who live in this region, these are Naga women wearing shawls in red that they have woven themselves. On the other hand, there are Manipuri indigenous women who are wearing their funeral attire in, and putting that banner, save indigenous people of Manipur at one of the protest sites in our home areas. Um, and if you look at this, these are the Tagin people who are in the north of, uh, the north of, of Northeast where I come from and these uh, borders uh, China and China still has not recognized uh, this as a part of our region. In fact, what is interesting of what two of the largest, the largest democracy in the world, India, does not recognize the existence of indigenous people. India says 1.3 billion people are all indigenous, so they refuse to uh, like give the term indigenous people to us. Rather, they use an old colonial construct of you know uh, which the British gave uh, as a divide and rule policy. These are um, Lepcha people, indigenous people from Sikkim. Look at their faces. Um, will you identify them as Indians? How does the face of an Indian, I'm talking about Indians in India, okay? I always get confused in terms of like, um, because here, uh, uh, you know, the word Indian is used in many ways. But here, um, bringing the issue of uh, the indigenous people in uh, Asiatic um, India, as I can say now, just. Weaving is very much a part of our indigenous culture. Um, and these are images uh, from our uh, office in Manipur right now where people are, the women are weaving. What I'm wearing today is woven from Manipur and I wear it to honor our women. Now, the interesting thing about indigenous areas that of this area that we are talking about is once the pandemic lifts, and if you decide to come to these parts of India, you're not allowed to freely enter these indigenous areas. So you have to apply for a special permit called protected or restricted area permit to enter these indigenous parts of India. As a result, um, this part of India is completely, or this region of the world is completely locked out from the rest of the world. And that's why you would have hardly known about us. My presentation today is something, again, we have been asked not to speak about our region outside our th that part of the world. And, and then we have been threatened many times for telling the story of our people because uh, the nation states don't want the world to know, but we will keep telling. For the part which is in the Indian side, 45 million people, the history of 45 million indigenous people is completely blanked out. It is not in the syllabus for India for more than 70 plus years. And same thing on the Burmese side, um, which is currently in a civil war, uh, there are so many indigenous communities in Burma whose history is not there in the textbooks of the country. So I'm talking about 100 million people whose history is blanked out from, from, from other nation states which has actually occupied us. Um, just to give an uh, example of how racial distinct 
Uh, many of the terms that has been given to indigenous people, we are called chinkis, momos, chaumin, tribals, and subject to racial discrimination. This is a poster from one of our protest sites. And last year, as COVID was rising, people, indigenous people were asked to leave rented apartments, spat at, and called corona carriers and asked to go back to China because our faces look more Asiatic than the rest of Indians in, in that subcontinent. So we were uh, a, a subject to racial violence. And I will end with this in, in terms of uh, the story because um, I would love to hear from June too. But again, the idea of indigenous people in the Indian nation state right now is the idea that indigenous people don't have culture, they don't have history, and so our history is not history, historical enough. So what has happened is, for example, Manipur was an independent Asiatic nation state, which is annexed by India in 1949 after the British left. And it was in 1949 that Manipur was annexed to the Union of India. And in 1947, we had our own indigenous constitution called the Manipur Constitution Act of 1947, which was even done even before India had its own constitution just to give the idea. This is our indigenous script. Our script is based on body parts. Again, it's, uh, I, the language that I speak is Tibeto-Burman group of language. And in terms of the militarization, we will come back later, but just a couple of images to say how militarized our region is. 300,000 troops operating right now in the indigenous areas of the region that I come from. There are 350 military stations all across our indigenous territories. Our historic and archaeological sites are completely in, in, in the, our, you know, our, his, our places of lakes, our hillocks, all militarized. Our schools are cinema halls. I don't remember going to a cinema hall in Manipur because it is all occupied, our schools. And so many people internally displaced. India does not recognize IDP, so they are like squandering in hundreds of camps all across our territories. There is population engineering going on in our region too, and more than 50,000 lives have been lost, 20,000 indigenous women widowed in my home state, Manipur alone. And I'm sorry I'm bringing these images. People always talk about, when they talk about conflict in the Indian subcontinent, talk about Kashmir. But Manipur, where I come from, has been, I've seen so many massacre sites of indigenous people in our territories. And this is some of the images of graves being dug up. And till today, we haven't got justice for like hundreds of people have been killed in this. In this. And uh, these are some of the families holding the images of their loved ones. And rape has been used as a weapon of war in these communities. And I'll end with this. Um, image uh, to give the message of not just pain, but of hope, resistance and resilience. Because we have an incredible 116 year old indigenous women's movement in Manipur and Northeast of India that I come from. And, and the women of, of, of Manipur have really resisted militarization by patrolling the streets at night with bamboo torches, by physically tussling with Indian armed forces before they take our young boy or girl away or young child away or a youth away from us. Because of the martial law, we cannot even go to courts. So I am a product of some of these amazing mothers of Manipur who patrol the streets at night, who continue to resist militarization of our bodies, of our lands and territories. We were doubly colonized, first by British and then second by the Indian nation state. And this is the resistance and the resilience that we are continuing de developing different techniques in our region. And our generation have also uh, uh, you know, joined in the movement. Uh, that's why we set up the, the Northeast India Women Initiative for Peace and the Manipur Women Gun Survivors Network and hosted indigenous women, peace um, you know, historic initiatives for peace and even uh, dabbled in the field of drafting le legislations and doing advocacy at the international level and building alliances with indigenous people from around the world. So I'm really happy today that we, we will be in conversation with June. With this, um, thank you, Yam Nungai Jare. And thank you so much, Hunab, for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much, Bina, for that just incredible, thought-provoking uh, frank 
and um, you know, disturbing, but also um, giving us some really meaty things to think about this evening and uh, to uh, help generate our conversation together. Um, so now I want to invite uh, June L. Lorenzo um, to join in the, uh, there we are. And I will offer a, uh, an introduction for June as well. So June L. Lorenzo, Laguna Pueblo, Navajo, Diné, is an attorney and consultant. Her law practice has included serving as attorney for Native Nations, the U.S. Senate and United States House of Representatives committees, the U.S. Department of Justice, voting rights legislation, in land claims lit litigation, and in human rights advocacy, advocacy for Indigenous peoples before the United Nations and the Organization of American States. Currently, she serves as a judge at Zia Pueblo and practices law in tribal and state courts in New Mexico. She remains engaged in projects at Laguna Pueblo, including advocacy on uranium legacy issues, protection of sacred sites, and protection of cultural patrimony. She holds a JD from Cornell Law School and a PhD in Justice Studies from Arizona State University. She is the author of publications on human rights and indigenous peoples, protection for sacred landscapes and the impacts of uranium mining on Laguna and other indigenous peoples. June, it is a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation this evening. And uh, please, uh, you're welcome to share your introduction. Uh, you're, you are muted. Uh, let's see, do I? Thank you, can you hear me now? Guati mm -hmm. uh, um, to my uh, Diné relatives, um, June Lorenzo, of course, and for the Diné who are who may be on the line, um, my clans are Kopaha um, from my mother's side, and I'm a Tsitnawashji or um, from the Turkey people. My my mother's clan is Water Edge, um, so that's where I come from. Uh, I was raised mostly at Laguna, although I've had the privilege to work for both uh, Laguna and Navajo Nation as an attorney. I won't have, um, and I think it's appropriate that we heard more of an introduction from Bina because people do know less about that. Um, but I'm just gonna show a couple of images just to locate where I am for those who may not be from the United States. So let's see if I can screen share um, where I'm located uh, let's see. Okay, so um, I'm going to use a little cursor. So I Laguna Pueblo is right here. This is New Mexico state within the United Southwestern United States, and all these um, little looking little looking pueblos are native nations. And of course, the largest is the Dene um, or Piquea is. Navajo Nation, and then the Muscalero Apache and Hickory Apache Indian Reservation. So there are 20 Pueblo uh, tribes in New Mexico, and then Navajo Nation and two Apache um, nations in New Mexico. And so this is where I'm situated um, in, in Laguna, uh, New Mexico, for those who don't know the Southwestern United States very well. And um, let me show, I just want to, just to show the contrast between where I live and where, this is my village. I just took this right before the session. So I stood up on a mesa that looks, this looks um, in a southeasternly direction. And this looks up on a mesa over my village. Um, Laguna Pueblo has six villages and mine is Pawati village or Guishji as we call it. And um, behind the, you can see these sort of man-made shapes. You'll see more, but this is um, landscape from three decades of uranium mining, which is very close to the Pueblo and ju like just below here. So there's been a large impact on my home community from three decades of uranium mining. So this is looking Southeast and from the same place, um, and the core of the village is right here, the main core where a lot of the religious sacred buildings are, are situated are about here. And so looking 
northeast, um, I just wanted to share the contrast in geography. So um, looking northeast, this is what you see, which is, I live in the high desert. I live at about 7,000 feet in altitude, a huge contrast from where Bean is from. And um, so, you know, growing up so close um, to the land um, obviously has impacted who I am. Um, and so, uh, and by way of introduction, we were, um, I'm going to leave this impact message here. We Pueblos were colonized by Spain in the 1500s, and we were under Spanish um, colonization for about 300 years. And then um, when Mexico declared independence from Spain, we then experienced a short period of colon uh, colonization from Mexico. And then of course, um, the United States after um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And that treaty, I, another thing is that um, many native nations in, the, in North America talk, America talk about treaties they have between they and the US government. They don't really exist between Pueblos because we were never um, at war with the United States in the same way that perhaps um, the United States was with Navajo Nation and they, they actually signed a treaty. Um, but the treaty between the United States and um, Mexico recognized the land grants. And I put that in quote because Spain quote unquote gave us land, um, but they, they, they said they would honor those land grants um, and that the so-called citizens of Mexico had a choice between becoming US citizens or remaining as Mexican citizens. And of course, you know, our people felt like they were neither and, and you know, wanted their identity as um, citizens of their own nations. So uh, I'm going to get out of that screen, see if I can do that successfully. Okay. Um, and so we want it, so waves of colonization. The largest impact I would say on my community and, and, and New Mexico in general really has been the whole nuclear cycle all the way from extraction in my community to uh, processing because there were mills and communities um, in a community 45 minutes from where I live um, to Los Alamos Nuclear Laboratory, where bombs were actually, you know, and the Trinity site, which is near Muscalero Apache in Southern New Mexico, where it was tested. And then of course, now one of the big issues in New Mexico is um, a proposal to create a large um, nuclear waste site. So almost all, all the phases of the nuclear cycle have been in this tiny state of New Mexico. Um, and, uh, let's see. I think that I'm going, I want it to honor the five minutes that we were given. So I think I can weave in other things about myself into the conversation. So I think that I'm going to stop there. I just wanted to talk about the things that have really impacted me and continue to impact my community. So um, I just want to leave room for the conversation. Thank you so much, June, for that introduction. Um, being from uh, Okiawinga Pueblo, it's wonderful just to have that picture of uh, back home in the Southwest. And uh, Bina, if you would go ahead and join in as well. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, I'll go ahead and kick us off with uh, the first question, but I want to invite uh, our uh, attendees this evening, if you have questions, uh, to go ahead and put those, uh, write the, type those into the chat. and. Um, we will either draw those in as the conversation unfolds, or uh, we'll also have a uh, period of, uh, in just a bit for a little bit more uh, formal Q&A. Um, but my first question uh, for the two of you, um, after your presentations, actually I think about it slightly differently, but is how is it that you have become uh, active in addressing issues relating to indigenous women's rights, environmental racism, peacemaking and sovereignty, after hearing your uh, presentations, the question is actually, how could you not in a lot of ways? <laughs> um, and who have been some of your role models and mentors in this work? Go 
Go ahead, Bina. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, honestly, when I was young, I actually wanted to be a physicist, Anthony. I was amazed by the phenomena of light and I thought I will you know, do research on the phenomena of light and discover something. That was a little girl's dream. So one, when one grows up in a conflict area like Manipur, when the child grows up in a place which is contaminated by uranium, we don't know. <laughs> we think it's normal. We don't realize. So it was the same thing for me. When I was growing up with so much of militarization, with so much of the martial law, where I could be killed any moment and my niece actually died in the conflict. And my parents were nearly shot dead. So I've seen violence at very, very close quarters. And the more I grew up, I realized the violence hadn't stopped. So, um, and I left home to come to, to India's capital, Delhi, to do my like graduation and my master's degree. And, and that's when uh, I realized when I was telling the story of Manipur to the rest of other people in, in the Indian subcontinent, they didn't believe what I was saying. So it made me realize that the situation that I grew up was absolutely abnormal. So I started in my university city to research and write about it actually. So um, this is how I started our work because of, of, of a continuum of violence which just didn't end as I was growing up. So this is why how I, 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 I turned I am a scholar, but then I also realize what is the use of our scholarship, which is where our, our research is just in the library books or in a PhD thesis. So what I have done is actually converted my research into social action. So, and we, we talk about, and writing the thesis, my master's thesis was mapping on why the conflict is in our indigenous territories, who is arming and training, you know, our people who is, uh, who, who, where are the military located? All this research that I showed today was our own research. There was no work in front of us, you know? Mm -hmm. so when you ask whom, who was your role model? We, the only thing I remember asking my father was there's so much of violence. I remember uh, we call father as Pabung in my native language. So I said, Pabung, how will you stop this? He said, I have no idea. And when my own father, my own parents didn't know the answer, that's when I realized that our generation have to seek answers to, to confronting and mitigating violence. And while doing that, I, I came in touch with many of these extraordinary women leaders that you met who are patrolling the streets at night with bamboo torches, our incredible indigenous women. And I just followed them. And many of them have not even gone to school in their lives, can you imagine? So many of these women. So I started realizing that the best education I've imbibed in my life are on the streets of Manipur. <laughs> in the villages of Manipur. Um, but yes, absolutely, this is how I would, how the work started. Oh gosh, um, I know we got to talk about this a little bit before. And so, um, you know, uh, you know how some people, they like, they know what they want to do and they spend their whole life around that one thing. My life has been a little different. I've sort of had a common theme, but I've done different things. And so um, I didn't, you know, like grow up wanting, I mean, I didn't, I was the first one in my family to graduate from, from university. So I, it, you know, I was the first one in my large extended family to graduate from college. So it was really, you know, I'm grateful for people in school who encouraged me to think about um, going beyond high school. Um, my father dropped out because he, of, of university because he couldn't afford, um, there were no scholarships in those days. And my mother went to high school and then, you know, they started raising a family. So I didn't have, I didn't even think about being a lawyer until somebody put that idea in my head when I was in, in university. Um, and so, um, you know, first I had this sort of idea of a career as being an attorney, which when I was in law school, um, a, a while ago, there were still weren't that many native attorneys compared to now in, and I knew many of them. And so um, you were taught and I, and I did like pr programs outside of law school on federal Indian law. And we learned a certain kind of law. Well, after I practiced with Navajo nation and I worked in Washington DC, I worked with uh, an NGO 
the last job before I moved from Washington, D.C., and really began to question these, these basic concepts of so-called federal Indian law, like thinking the trust doctrine was just a given instead of seeing how incredibly racist it could be. And so it made me start rethinking a lot of the things I've learned. And then I started in the late 90s going to the United Nations and listening to these amazing activists. We were all negotiating on the UN Declaration. And so I was privileged to be involved in that process with many, many other indigenous people. And I really learned on the ground from activists and from some legal scholars who were, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't study, my battery is running low, I better plug in. I didn't study um, international law. I really didn't have that option. Um, excuse me for just one second. I'm going to plug in this computer. I'm on mute, there we go. And while June's uh, plugging in, uh, one of the questions or themes that she's raising is the issue of the status of indigenous peoples. Um, you, know, you touched upon this in your, um, in your presentation of how uh, indigenous peoples are like, um, understood within the, the Indian state. Uh, and June, if that's also something you can uh, address as well. Well, you know, I started, I mean, these basic concepts internationally, I got to meet people from all over other continents who were, you know, talking, well, what does sovereignty mean? Um, what's the status of indigenous people? And when we talk and negotiate with, with people, you know, foreign diplomats about self-determination, all of these things that I just never, that I took for granted, I had to really think through because we had to negotiate with um, really human rights um, people um, around the world who really were pretty wedded to this idea that human rights is about individual rights. And we spent a lot of time and energy, you know, working on trying to convince them that no, I mean, we're talking about collectively held rights. That was a huge thing. So that really transformed me. But also what came out of that, and I just want to take this, then year after practicing like 30 years, I really be and working on the uranium issues, I really began to look um, at see the patriarchy that has been so much a part of colonialism among my peoples. And um, I spent a good amount of my PhD research on the impacts, but also looking at um, the legal systems. And so, you know, a lot of people don't know, but um, legal scholars see that indigenous law often referred to as Catonic law is one of the seven major legal traditions of the world right up there with Judaic law, with common law, with, um, and so, you know, and I really talked about legal systems clashing because we did have legal systems when Europeans arrived. And so, and a big piece of theirs was patriarchy and a big part of ours was matriarchy. And so that's a lot of what I spent um, my, um, and, uh, you know, my PhD work on. And I was privileged to, to do a special, I mean, a, a PhD program with other Pueblo people in which we could focus on Pueblo issues. And I'll talk more about that later. But of course, that filters into the work I do, my activism, all my work. So those are sort of, sort of formative things that happen with me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Mina, can you talk about the status of indigenous peoples in um, the Indian state? Yes, as I mentioned to you that two by third of the world's indigenous people, about 260 million live in Asia. And, but the status of indigenous people in Asia are as follows, number one, as I mentioned, China, which is the largest populated country in the world has uh, you know, signed the UN declaration, the rights of indigenous people, which uh, June had just mentioned, but it denies the existence of indigenous people in the country. <laughs> How, how ridiculous can be, right? Now, India, on the other hand, which is considered the world's old, uh, largest democracy within quotes, uh, again says that 1.3 billion Indians are all indigenous. That's why Indian uh, government will never come to the UN permanent from an indigenous people. Their seat is always empty because India says there's no need for us to be there. But on the other hand, what has happened is uh, how India has, uh, you know, we have in India, rather than use, giving the term indigenous people, what they have done is taken the old British colonial system of identifying people as Adivasis or like Vanavasi means people of the jungle, 
people of the forest, mm -hmm. the tribes, and then divide it, divide it, indigenous people into groups and subgroups in such a way that no one is made to literally sort of have a common thread of understanding. And then so many indigenous people in India are not given that even that status. So there is so much of that, which is a very colonial form of dividing indigenous communities so that, that it, is, it is the amount of money or the little thing that they throw at us that people are fighting for. It's like in federally recognized and non-recognized kind of thing, you know, which I am also slowly trying to understand. So this is the status. It is really, really difficult. India denies the existence of indigenous people. India denies the existence of racism. Mm -hmm. India denies even if 50,000 indigenous people are killed in my home region, India denies that there is conflict within India. So it's the nation state's continuum of denial. And, and then they, they use their law of exception to impose a martial law, which takes away our right to life. So this is the dilemma that we are in. Um, uh, in our region. Again, we have been muzzled, our voices have been muzzled for over 50, 60 years. That's why you would have never heard about this conflict. And uh, as I mentioned, we are even under threat to be speaking about this conflict. So this is the kind of, uh, of situation that nation states are subjecting indigenous people in our part of the world by denying our existence. You both are... Speaking about different, you know, forms of erasure, different forms of fracture, uh, colonial erasure and fracture, and uh, whether that's uh, gender-based and uh, the imposition of patriarchy, um, the complete just uh, erasure of indigenous people by kind of folding, um, yeah, people into a larger popul populace, um, you know, which can also happen here in the United uh, in the United States. Uh, populations, you know, native people as a population rather as than as nations. Um, I want to come to one of the points that um, you've both you've both touched upon uh, and that does kind of tie in what you, you were just speaking to, which is the is gender-based violence and it's especially as it relates to um, extractive enterprises. So uh, many indigenous activists have talked about the connection between certain forms of colonial and settler colonial environmental extraction. In the United States context, we have the uh, Keystone Pipeline, Dakota Access Pipeline, and the uh, epidemic of sexual and gender-based violence against indigenous women, um, the missing and murdered indigenous women, uh, activism and No More Soul and Sisters, for example. Um, how do you see um, th this connection between gender-based violence and extractive uh, enterprises in your respective areas? Well, I I'll say one piece of it because we can go on forever, um, but <laughs> there, are so there are so many aspects of it because, because I think of the intersectionality that we're dealing with and so, um, I mean, on a, on, a, on a really basic level, um, it's violence against, and, and part of, this is part of what I talked about in, in my PhD work, but it's not just violence against the woman, um, it's violence against the female. And if we see, and many of our people talk about, I mean, our words for the earth are feminine words, and a lot of our spiritual beings are female, uh, have female names and so so you know extraction is violence against our mother extraction is violence against the feminine and not and so and and with that comes you know the the whole the, the machinery the extraction the capitalism all of that that whole that that whole you know that whole what i want to call it the whole piece but connect it to it are many stories of violence against women. And I, but I just think we don't pay enough attention to violence against the female in all of this. And so, um, you know, I mean, it's becoming well known that these man camps more and more pop up around, you know, around extractive areas. And they're very tied to missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, you know, definitely in North America, people don't really see that, um, you know, I some things are not as obvious. And so if, you know, in my community it was heavily impacted, they only employed, 
one, one of the things that I've written about is how, um, you know, there was a lot of, um, I don't know if equality is the right word, but, you know, there was a lot of partnership between men and women and how they lived. It was very agricultural. And, what, and one of the, and so here comes this uranium mine and they only employ men. And so men suddenly have more power in the outside world because they're the ones who get paid, they get the paycheck. And then these little border towns off of Pueblo land start making money off of selling alcohol and you get the violence against women connected to that. So, so many layers of, um, you know, the ex communities experience differently. Um, and so, you know, it may not be the, the violence that looks the same, but it, it's different kinds of violence that I would argue do, you know, inner heart, you know, spiritual damage, just as harmful as if someone, you know, received a bruise from, from getting hit. And I just think there are layers of violence that, um, that people just don't pay attention to. For, for my community, uh, just imagine, government of India is planning 160 dams all over our indigenous territory. And these are high seismic zones. And this is meant to sort of increase India's energy needs as it becomes an economic superpower where our indigenous territories have been completely through dams controlled by damming our rivers, our waterways, which is our life. That's one of the violence that we have seen, structural violence there. Number two is in terms of the other violence which is happening is in terms of a, a process which I call it chemical warfare. Mm. Flooding our region with guns and drugs. You know, many indigenous people there has been a rise in um, fake pharmaceutical industries because our region is very close to the Golden Triangle area, which produces 66% of the world's, you know, heroin, okay? Laos, Burma, Thailand. And the bags of Indian politicians are never checked. So the Northeast of India, which is bordering this area, became a place where what is grown on the other side are poppies, but you cannot smoke a poppy, right? You have to convert it into heroin for that you need chemicals called acetic anhydride. So, and India is South Asia's largest manufacturer of acetic anhydride. So this will push into our territories and the finished products is pushed out. So in, in a result, a lot of our young people have been prone and that Manipur and Mizoram has one of the highest HIV rates in the entire country in India. These are places, indigenous populations. So I've seen my own classmates dying of drug overdose. Can you imagine? Young lives, 15, 14, 16, including my own brothers, my own cousins. I've seen so many young people's lives lost in what I call a deliberate chemical warfare done to poison not just our rivers, but our bodies, our young youth. That's one thing. In terms of extractive industry, uh, we have a commonality like June is working on, on, on this uranium and Meghalaya is a place where the Indian atomic energy has been doing mining in our indigenous territories. And they did mining and, and recently there were leaks and then so many fish died and then so many children formed of deformed bodies. In fact, um, I was in touch with some groups who are working on a concept of environmental violence by Andrea Carmen and many groups at Columbia. And in fact, from there I learned what is environmental violence committed on indigenous territories and we found and submitted our evidence to them. Number two, a lot of pesticides which are banned and around the world being dumped in our indigenous territories. As a result, many Manipuri women are their reproductive like system is really like a chart because of the way these pesticides have harmed on uh, us, our bodies and our lives. So, so much of environmental violence, so much of this happening in, in, our, in our region. In terms of gender-based violence, it's really real. We, with the indigenous women of our region see two kinds of violence there. One, within the region where there is militarized. So there's so much of sexual violence not a single armed force personnel who have committed rape has been punished by courts of law. No, because of this martial law. We cannot touch them. We cannot, 
So the rapists are, are, are all roaming free in our region. Number two, when indigenous women come out from the region to work in other parts of India, you know, we are subjected to another form of violence, sexual. In fact, it, uh, this is a cusp of gender and race because a lot of our indigenous women, the rest of India considers us as morally loose, that we, we could be done away with, you know, that we are easily available for the sexual favor. So a lot of this wrong stereotyping of, so when I saw the violence against Asian Americans here in, in United States, I saw so much of peril because a lot of indigenous women, because they come from very difficult circumstances to escape the violence, the conflict, they work in spy industry and they are, they are, they are killed because they think their work is not like moral enough. So I saw very, very strong similarities in the, in the gender and, and you know, uh, uh, racism, which is at the cusp of race as well as gender on the bodies of indigenous women. And I've seen myself together with our team, we have packed so many indigenous women's bodies of the way they've been killed and murdered in Indian metropolitan cities. Rengamfi, Juliet, um, uh, these are some of the names that we continuously remember on the violence that is being done on our lives and, and, and this continues. So it's so, so real. Uh, what is happening in indigenous women here in many parts of the United States and other around the world is also equally happening to the indigenous women of Manipur and Northeast of India. I just want to say one thing that you, you thought, and, and earlier when I was talking about violence done on the female, I meant the feminine, um, but, but um, one of my colleagues, um, I want to mention two important pieces of work that I think really speak to this. So one of my colleagues in my PhD program, her name is um, Corrine, um, Corrine Sanchez. She's with Tewa Women United and they do a lot of work around reproductive health. And you know they say that a child's first environment is the mother's womb. And if the mother um, is impacted by um, toxic things that can get to the child and that's a kind of violence as well. And um, there are people who live um, whose water has been contaminated, not only here, but all over the world. And so imagine the impact that has on, on the womb. Um, in 1979, there was this huge, huge spill of uranium um, tailings um, in Church Rock, New Mexico, which is near Gallup, which is on the Navajo Nation. And that impacted many women. And out of, an organization that I do work with is called the Multicultural Alliance for a Safe Environment. And out of that, um, they've cooperated with um, the University of New Mexico and um, to do this um, birth cohort study on the impacts of women and children. And that's just really important research to demonstrate that kind of environmental you know, violence from you know, connected to extraction. Thank you, uh, June. If I'm, I can ask a question to June, yes. since it's a conversation. And June, you can ask me too, and we can all ask I, each other. Yes, but, yes. But <laughs> you have a law background. This is a question for you. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm asking is, of course, the UN UNDRIP is the UN, uh, you know, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous. But that's within the nation state. The United Nations is as good as its nation states wants it to be. Now, our rivers are poisoned. Our lands are militarized. There's so much of violence going on and so much of like conflict. And uh, as I shared in our images, so many lives have been lost. But indigenous people, we can't even go to any courts of law. Our nations don't allow. Where do we go? The International Criminal Court doesn't recognize. We cannot take. So where do we go for our sense of justice, June? This is something that I've been asking myself because we need to get justice for indigenous people, but the world systems are not there for us. So do we create one? What do we do? Well, I think um, part of the answer, Bina, is that um, sometimes people think like court is the only place you can go to get relief. And in fact, there are human rights mechanisms where you can go. And one of the better known, which, um, you know, another organization I work with is called the International Indian Treaty Council. And they've done these um, under the, um, uh, the Convention on the, the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, otherwise known as the, the CERD Committee, they have a special procedure um, when there are measures, you know, special measures can be taken if there are instances of 
um, discrimination and so on. Um, also, there, the UN has a system of special rapporteurs. There's a, there's a special rapporteur for so many things and they can also um, take actions. Now, it's not like court, but they can take measures that can bring attention to these, that can define them as human rights violations. And that's part of the work because if you go to court, you have to be able to argue that it is a human rights violation to begin with. But I've seen, even though they're not perfect, but I've seen these special measures really um, provide not only like, a sh you know, the light shines on these human rights violations, but in some cases, you know, some measure of relief. I know that happened when the Philippines declared um, two indigenous women that we both know as terrorists. Um, and so, you know, so they, so other folks um, asked for, you know, special measures and so on. So you don't have to go to the world court. Um, in fact, we can't, um, but I, I think, you know, again, I'm not, you know, I'm not an international lawyer. I'm more of an international advocate, but these, these mechanisms are, my goodness. And I mean, when it should be getting better, here we are 2020, it's getting worse. And so these mechanisms are super busy. I mean, it used to be in the Americas, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, um, but you know they have a, a huge caseload, but still there are places outside of actual courts um, that you, where you can seek assistance. Let's um, jump in here. And you know, one of the, our uh, words in our title this evening is this word peacemaking, um, which you know, I find both compelling and fraught in a lot of ways, in part because um, the idea of peacemaking is, you know, can be a you know, real, uh, something that nation states use to suppress um, histories of violence and even like an ongoing violence. Um, so, you know, I guess kind of taking up uh, your question, Abina, I'm, I'm curious as to what, how you conceptualize what you know? What is this idea of peacemaking that you know has been so, so key to your work? Um, what types of forums? I mean, you've been really active in creating networks of people, alliances. Um, where have you seen some of this work take traction? Uh, you know, gain traction um, for you, and how? What does that word peace or peacemaking entail for you? Yes. Um... When the notion of peace for us, without looking into the academic jargons, for us, it was to be just be able to stay alive in Manipur, where today, because of the martial law, even an unborn child is a suspect in the eyes of the law. And if you protest against this martial law, you are called anti-nationals, secessionists, terrorists, everything negative about when we try to resist or we try to tell the Indian nation state or a nation state saying, this is not right. So it's very, very difficult. So we have tried for almost a decade and a half to go to New Delhi, to go to United Nations, uh, to see how can we get our sense of peace. And you're right, Anthony, it's been very, very, very disappointing. But at the same time, uh, what is, what is happening is we are realizing how nation states work. Uh, as Charles Tilly said, state making is an organized crime. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and these are, we still live with the coloniality of power till today, including the English that I'm speaking. And, and so there is so much of un, unraveling, the undoing, decolonizing or creating what Václav Havel would say, creating a parallel polis, a parallel system where we don't ha always have to go to the United Nations or to a nation state who will never give us a sense of justice and peace the way we would like. Uh, because for example, just asking for the inclusion of 45 million indigenous people's history in the textbooks of India has been denied asking for the removal of a martial law so that India's democracy could be pristine has been denied. So our search for peace have been met with denials and more force and more suppression that we are pushed to a wall. So what do we do, do in that case? 
um, you feel upset, you feel where, where have we reached? We feel the world is dark, the world is not listening to us. So, um, but on one, on the other hand, if there is no hope alive, then how we are going to do that? That's the reason why I found a glimmer of hope when I met indigenous people from around the world at the UN Permanent Forum. <laughs> hmm. When I met people from around the world, I realized that I belong to all of us together, you know? That's how the idea of the Global Alliance of Indigenous People Gender Justice was born. Not to do projects from nation states, but to <laughs> learn each other's histories. I don't know a Navajo song. Neither you know about a Manipuri song. We should be knowing each others. We should not be just singing Baba Black Sheep. We should be able to teach our children, our native tongue, our native songs, our native lullabies, our native histories. So I felt it was really important to create a parallel way in which we are able to connect when we taste each other's foods, visit each other's homes, you know, do each other's dances. We have in Manipur a beautiful dance, which we do on Minlight called Tabal Chongba, where we hold hands and dance around a fire or a drum. It's one of the most beautiful things I've seen. And, and so, uh, so think that the work that you are like, culture that is being done by indigenous people here has been really, for me, hope. That's, that's when I, I feel peacemaking, looking at the nation state hasn't really worked. They, they dishonored all your 400 plus treaties, didn't they? <laughs> and all our peace treaties in Northeast India have also been dishonored. So can we create indigenous peace treaties where we actually honor each other? So when indigenous people are able to create our own treaties and not with nation states and an indigenous resistance, therefore, I feel is the need of the hour to be able to find our collective peace. Well, you know, Jill, I just wanna, um, Vina, you made me think of one thing which, you know, I'll be, uh, you know, um, ill thought of after I say this, but I mean, you know, when I think about the treaties in the United States and other places, I mean, in the United States, all these treaties were signed and many of them are actually termed treaties of peace, right? But who are they treaties of peace for, first of all? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are many cases that went, be, you know, come before United States courts about, you know, how should the treaty be interpreted according to the understanding of the tribes in the 1700s or whatever? But really, I mean, when you step back and you study American history, they were treaties of peace, but they were the United States idea of peace. They were to get the Indians out of the way so they could build a democracy, right? And so, I mean, and, and so we go around, the United States goes around the world wanting to do so-called peace, but they think the only way to do peace is by having democracies, right? And you've just said about India, right? I mean, the largest democracy and, and all the, the violence that happens there. So um, I think that if indigenous peoples were asked to say, well, what does peace mean for you? It would be something very different. And of course, it would be very different answers depending on the the landscape, the epistemologies, the people, and all of those things. And so, I think that um, I don't think there's any one answer. I, but I, you know, but what does it mean in a context? I mean, if you ask indigenous peoples in these conflict areas, what does peace mean for you? Um, I think that would be very important to hear. It doesn't mean just the, you know, for me, it doesn't mean oh, we'll just stop fighting because peace doesn't happen just by, you know, when we stop fighting, there's a lot more work after that. So we're coming in uh, within five minutes or so of um, the close of our conversation here. And wow, this has been so rich and so many, um, so many things we could, we could draw and talk for, I think, probably hours and you know, days and, and both of you have actually that this has been yeah, life work for both of you um you know i'm i think structures you know uh you know you're talking about sharing songs sharing dances um june you've talked about uh the importance of uh, indigenous epistemologies and you know spiritual practices um broadly broadly speaking um 
so one of the um, questions that I have is, you know, how how do you see um, how are you energized uh, in in your work and your activism? What types of whether that's artistic or expressive forms, um, you know, help to give you life and energy in your work, um, you know, re relationships, those types of things. Uh, where do you find your source of life and uh, that kind of drives, you know, keeps you going? <laughs> ah, that's a really good question. You know, I'll be very honest with you that this time has been really difficult for me. Um, I, I've lost about five people to COVID on my mother's side, and we've lost a number of people here where I live in Laguna. Um, and many people not to COVID, but we have really important rituals for grieving, and we haven't been able to do that. And in the last year, I've lost people who are just really foundational and that they connected me to language and culture. Um, so it's been really hard. It's been really, really hard. And I was talking with someone recently about how there's just so much, I mean, I went to a family memorial just last week. Um, and, um, and of course, because of health disparities, indigenous peoples have probably suffered more. Um, and it's been really difficult and, uh, so how do you, you know, it's not just the fact that there are conflicts in the world. It's not just the fact that indigenous peoples continue to face discrimination. It's not just that people still don't understand the doctrine of discovery and its impacts today. It's not still that I, that I you know, don't see racial discrimination around me everywhere. I mean, on top of that is the, the real, very real loss in my community. And so, um, I just think, um, I mean, it is a real struggle. And, and statistically, um, Native youth are two or three times more likely to commit suicide than, than non-Native youth in this country. So, I mean, it's very real. I mean, it's, it's, been, it's been a difficult time. Um, so I think, I think, you know, one of the things that I can identify really is it's kind of what Bina, you were talking about, but it's when you're connected to a people, it's not just about you. And somewhere in the midst of that, you know, I'm not saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm too good to go. It's just that, you know what, my grandmother, my mother, my grandmother, my great grandmas, who I was fortunate to know, um, they probably really had it worse than me in their lifetimes. They probably struggled a lot more than me um, and they did their part. And so at the very least, what gives me, it's not so much hope, but maybe it's hope, but it's, it's just remembering, you know what? Um, I belong to something greater and it's not just about me. And um, they found it within them to do their part. And so from that, I take strength that I need to do my part. So like several generations below me, um, they can be grateful that I did my part and they'll remember to do theirs. That's all I can think of right now. Yes. For, for us, um, we the people, Manipuri people, uh, we worship nature it means every morning we start our morning by paying, looking up to the direction of the sun and offering water, fresh born water, flower and an incense. Like, and same thing when night falls, we offer it to the moonlight. In short, what I'm trying to say is when things are so difficult as we are experiencing, June has said, I just also lost a friend uh, 24 hours ago to COVID in, in, in India. I've lost uh, so many, and currently many of my friends in Burma are been are incarcerated by the mil Burmese military. So it is tough. But the thing is, um, if we get weak, then those who commit these crimes will think mm -hmm. that what they are doing is right. So we have to stubbornly <laughs> resist knowing when to rest and when to get up and fight again. And for this, 
it's very important to stay connected with nature. Um, I've started hugging trees. It's really healing. <laughs> Uh, write a lot, you know, listen to a lot of songs. I've sent a song to both of you and please feel free to share <laughs> with others. Uh, it's really important that we keep this ray of hope alive, however tough it may be. But while doing that, please take care of ourselves. Take care of yourselves and take care of one another. Do not look at each other like commodities the way <laughs> Neoliberal economists will say, you know, you, you can only be friends if you benefit from one another. We oh, have to look yeah. at each other beyond. And I taught a course on women, war and peace. And, and this is what I discovered from 18, 19 year old students who told me that um, they look at life as an exchange commodity. And I was so shocked. This is not the way we have to honor each other's lives and existences. We cannot reduce ourselves to a monetary value or an exchange value, the way we have been taught in neoliberal communities. So we, we have to create what I call our own indigenous economies, our way of life, and, and let's work together towards it. And this is something that gives me hope to be able to Fine. That's why the Global Alliance of Indigenous People, again, I repeat, is not to get projects from nation states, but to find each other. So when we connected on 19th of March, when we met, um, you know, we, we were able to, it was, the, the convening was done of communities from seven global indigenous social cultural zones of the world. And for the first time, we were meeting all together in a platform and to learn from one another, to listen from one another and take our collective strength from one another. You know, the power of solidarity to tell each other that, are you okay? <laughs> you know, uh, calling someone up and say, are you okay? Do you need anything? Are you okay? Just holding each other's hand, that creates magic, that creates the healing and that will create the love which will ensure that we're able to get that energy to fight any kind of oppression, suppression or repression in the world is what I truly believe in. And um, surround yourself with good friends, <laughs> surround yourself and, and cook your own indigenous food. I've started cooking a lot, you know, and to be able to get that strength and resilience. And I hope I, I can one day cook for all of you too. And, and continue Thanks. to keep that hope alive is what I truly believe in to go on. I just want to um, take a moment, you've both, uh, to honor the words that you've shared uh, here. Um, and uh, just to take a moment of silence, actually, to honor what you've shared about, about the, um, the challenges, the grief, the loss of the people who have passed um, in this year. And also just to sit with uh, the insights and the words that you, you have shared with us both this evening. So we'll just take a, a few minutes to, or a few moments and then I'll, um, uh, then we can say our, our goodbyes. A few deep breaths. All right, thank you so much, uh, June and Bina, uh, for all that you've shared for this conversation. I consider this conversation sacred space, one of these things that um, is uh, both insightful, energizing, um, I think for hopefully for the three of us and for many of us who are um, attending this evening. I'll just uh, express once again our deep, deep gratitude from the Native American and Indigenous Studies Working Group at Harvard and the Harvard University Native American Program for you uh, being with us this evening. Thank you. Yeah, it was lovely. I look forward to many more conversations and I look forward to eating um, food that you prepared. And, and you're always welcome to come to my home here as well. Yes, I think that's so important. And you're all welcome to Manipur in our areas. We've got to visit each other, keep each other close, and we will get there. We will get there. <laughs> Thank you.
Kunep, uh, Sherry, Shelley, Anthony, all of you, and yes. everyone who's, who's tuning in. Thank you. Yes, for your thank time. you, Kunep, um, for doing this. Even for an introvert, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, th we'll see you all. And um, yes, yeah, so peace to everybody. Have a good evening. <laughs>